Down again? Or you think you got it? I'm fine going through it again. It's okay. Yeah, one more time. One more time. Okay. So, our basic notation that you have to remember, again, it should better be called nuclear notation, is written up above. Right. We've got our mass number, which is our protons and neutrons. Our atomic number is our protons. With that basic information, I can determine the number of neutrons because the difference between those gives me the number of neutrons. Do I see any information about the number of electrons? No. Not directly. It turns out that we do have a way to understand the number of electrons based only on what's shown there. All right? If we take a look at the symbols for protons and neutrons, do you see anything on the left-hand side of the symbol? <coughs> I know you're, you're like, what does that even mean? All right, so let's just take a look at a proton here. So there's our proton sitting in the middle there. What is written on the upper left-hand corner? Nothing. Why? Because scientists are lazy? Not a bad theory. <laughs> Getting kind of at the right idea, when would we look at isotopes? Different isotopes are what? They're an element, but there's something different about that element. Is a proton an element? No. That upper left-hand corner is the mass number for an element. Is a proton an element? No. So don't write anything in the upper left-hand corner, okay? Because it, it doesn't make sense to write anything there. How about in the lower left-hand corner? Again, nothing. Why? Okay, it's just a proton. It's not an atom. So is that the only corner around the symbol of proton that we could look at? No. Is there another corner? Okay. There's technically two more corners. One of them is blank, and one of them has a plus in it. What does that plus represent? Okay. It represents the charge on that species. What is in the upper right-hand corner of our symbol? Nothing. nothing. What is the mathematical number for nothing? Zero. Zero. What does that mean the charge is on this species? It is neutral. Okay, so that upper right-hand corner is our charge. Since nothing is written there, I know the charge is zero. Right. Well, do the neutrons affect the charge? What charge is a neutron? Neutron, neutron. neutral. It has no charge. So the neutrons don't affect the charge. What does affect the charge? Protons. Do I know how many protons there would be in this compound? Yeah. How do I know? I know that here it's a little weird. What are the number of protons in this atomic notation example? Z. There are Z protons. If my charge is zero, how many electrons must there be? Exactly Z. Why? So that those would cancel out to get me a charge of zero. Okay? So the upper right-hand corner is where we specify information about our charge. It is the net charge on the molecule, so it factors in both protons and electrons. It becomes tricky because a proton is positive and an electron is negative. negative. So we have to be aware of those charges because it will mess with your brain. And for those of you who think it's just a minus charge, it's not that big a deal, right? keep that in your mind because you will make a mistake in this semester where all you had to do was subtract and instead you added. Okay? So minus charges are the bane of your existence as far as science is concerned. It seems to be such a simple thing. Track those minus charges because they make a really big deal. Okay? So with that extra information, let's clear all that away. 
If we move to an example, there's our example shown. The element is, how do you know it's silicon? Because you've now memorized, because Tuesday to Thursday you had enough time to memorize all the names of the elements. Like, dude, I worked. I know. Don't stress, you should be starting to work. Okay, or starting to study. Okay? And I know that because I've memorized it. Okay? The atomic number I know is 14 because it's specified in the lower left-hand corner of this. How else do I know the atomic number is 14? So I just said, SI is found where on our periodic table? In the box that has 14 written right above it. Okay? So the symbol in conjunction with the periodic table tells us that atomic number. Okay? What does that atomic number represent? The number of protons. So I know silicon has 14 protons. This symbol tells me that the mass number is 29. Take a quick look at the periodic table for me. Is the mass number on the periodic table? I heard some people saying yes, but not looking at the periodic table. Because if we look at the periodic table, what is the mass number on the periodic table? Trick question, it's not on there. What is 28.09? It's the atomic mass, not the mass number. Isn't the mass of an atom the same as the mass? No, I'm confused. Me too. Okay. Different things. The mass number is specifically given to you in the atomic notation. You cannot pull it from the periodic table. All you can pull from the periodic table is the atomic mass, a different thing. Okay. So if I know that the mass number is 29, okay, I know, let's see... I know that the number of protons plus the number of neutrons equals that number. Okay, so P plus N equals 29. Okay, how would I figure out the number of neutrons? Well, what else did I know in the previous system? Well, I know that P equals 14. Okay, what we've now just generated is a system of two equations and two unknowns. We can now solve. If you haven't heard that phrase before, it's also known as algebra. Okay? So that whole mathematics class where they're playing around with variables and numbers, there it is. It's important for chemistry. I'll never do algebra again. Ta-da! Okay? We can do the subbing around, and we can find out that we have 15 neutrons for silicon. Question's not on this list, but I'm now going to ask it. What is the number of electrons? How do you know it's 14? Because when we look at the upper right-hand corner, what is specified? Nothing, which means the overall charge for that symbol as shown is zero. The number of electrons must equal the number of protons. So I would have 14 electrons. Okay? Kind of, sort of? Okay. So that was a fun walkthrough. Here we go. Nice little table for you to fill out. Okay. In theory, location, mass, charge, symbol should all be relatively easy and quick for you to do. Meaning is a little bit trickier. Okay. Fill out as much as you can in the next couple minutes, and then we'll go through and work through it. So hopefully you've nailed all of that down. Okay. You can laugh. That's fine. You don't have to have it yet. Okay. I don't think I made any mistakes. I think I'm good. Okay. But now the hard question. What does it mean? I give you 12 electrons. You have an atom with 12 electrons. What do you know? Does it necessarily? No. If the charge is neutral. I didn't tell you that. I just said you have 12 electrons and an atom. Yep, the first left never changes. Okay, those are as constant as they can be. We can refine them in different situations, but those never change. Okay. The meaning is ultimately, in my opinion, never going to change also. Okay. Okay. 
So the number of electrons and an atom doesn't really tell us anything. Okay? Well, it, it tells us we have an atom, and that, that atom has 12 electrons. Okay? So we didn't add any information to that. What if I tell you it has 12 protons? Why are you saying it becomes magnesium? If I have 12 protons, that means my atomic number is 12, which means I have magnesium. What if I change the number of electrons? Doesn't matter. The number of protons is still 12. What if I change the number of neutrons? Doesn't matter. The atomic number is still 12. So by identifying that we have an atom and that we know the number of protons, what have we found? We know the element. Right? So I would make the argument that our protons define the element. Okay? So starting with electrons doesn't work. Starting with protons does. Can we start with just neutrons? What if I tell you you have 12 neutrons and an atom? Right? It could depend on the isotope, because that's going to change the number of neutrons. The isotope of what? Of the element that has 12 neutrons. <laughs> okay? So starting with the number of neutrons also doesn't help us. Okay? So the number of protons becomes critical to the identification of the element. Right? Now that I've defined the element, I'm looking at magnesium with 12 protons, and I have 12 electrons. What does that tell me? That the charge is neutral. I know the charge is neutral. What if I have 10 electrons? The charge is positive. Now the charge is positive. It would be positive 2 because we had 12 protons, 10 electrons. There's still two protons as positive left over. So what do the electrons tell you then? The charge. They define the charge on the element. Right. And some people would challenge that because you need to know the number of protons okay, to figure out the charge. But you've already identified the protons by identifying the element. Okay, so my argument is that charge is determined based off of the number of electrons. Okay. Well, then what do the neutrons tell you? I tell, tell you have, hey, this will work, 12 neutrons on a magnesium atom. What can you tell me? You can tell me now the mass of that element. You can tell me that I am looking at magnesium 24. So the neutrons define the mass of the element. So having an understanding of what the number of these things mean can then help you draw conclusions about how they could potentially theoretically interact with their outside environment. Okay? That's the intent behind that meaning. Okay? Um, just pause for a second here. Those of you that printed out the slides are unfortunately not rewarded today. Because those of you that printed out the slides know what the next slide is. Which would be what? A quiz. Why are you not rewarded today? Because I didn't bring enough little slips of paper to pass out a quiz. So, I'll give you five minutes. Do it on your own. Do the best you can to recall whatever you can at this stage. This is not officially a quiz. You're not turning this in. Just write down your notes for the answers to these questions. Okay, so this is your personal quiz. No grade. So please don't tear out paper. I don't want it. On Tuesday, we talked about that content. If you haven't reviewed that lecture, that lecture was utterly meaningless. None of that content stuck in your brain, and you just proved it. Review your lectures within 24 hours. Okay? Um, so, names of famous chemists or physicists. We didn't really define them. Depending on who you talk to, a chemist or a physicist, they'll call these chemists or physicists. <coughs> Rutherford or Rutherford? It's one of those. Hey, hold up. We'll come back to Thompson. Uh, what's his uh, atomic structure with Rutherford? What did he give us? 
nucleus is ultimately his answer. He theorizes neutrons, but he doesn't have direct evidence of those neutrons yet. Okay. Um, how did he theorize a nucleus? Alpha particles at gold foil. Okay. Thompson. Discovery of electrons, thereby the discovery of protons. Okay. How did he come up with that? With a vacuum. Once we have a vacuum, we have cathode ray tubes that we can then see the existence of electrons. Okay. Um, what else might you tie to Thompson? The plum pudding model, his ultimate failure. Okay. Uh, who else? Dalton. Dalton. What do you have for Dalton? His atomic theory. You could go through and list out all five of his theories. As we continue through with our understanding of atomic structure, you should be able to go back and look at those theories and be like, that one's not true, that one's not true, that one's true, that one's true, that one's true. That one's true. Okay? And why? So his first theory was elements are completely indivisible. Not true because they're, uh, don't go to atoms. They're made up of yes. protons, neutrons, and electrons. So Thompson disproves Dalton's first theory. Okay. Uh, what else do you have? You got Chadwick and Neutron. How did he discover it? I don't know either. Sorry, I'm just curious. <laughs> Um, last one, which becomes relevant at the very end of this slide, because I didn't talk about it in enough depth. Mary Curie. Curie. What is Mary Curie famous for? Nobel Prize. Nobel Prize. Purifying the substance that gave alpha particles. So she was able to purify a radio radioactive element, and then that element was used in Rutherford's experiments, among other things. Any idea what element that was? Lead? No. Lead is actually not radioactive. Radium. Radium. Huh. I wonder why you came up with that. Yeah. Don't answer that question yet. Question two. Provide a topic to be discussed at any point from here forward in today's lecture. Why might I ask that question? See see to see if you're actually looking ahead. Should you be looking ahead? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay? If you're not... Remember, there's levels of being a student. Okay? I'm trying to tell you the ultimate level. If you can't get there, that's okay. And it doesn't mean you're not a good student. It just means we make mistakes every so often. Okay? So don't stress on that. Val should have the answer to this. Um, I said the other day, right? Isotopes. Yep. <laughs> isotopes, which I believe is the very next slide. Okay? The last one, an isotope. So we even had some foreshadowing. We haven't talked about isotopes yet, and yet this question mentions isotopes, probably because we're going to talk about them. Okay? An isotope was isolated with 88 protons and 138 neutrons. Provide the atomic notation for this element. Okay? So atomic notation, what are we looking at? Okay. We need to be determining the symbol. The symbol is dictated by the number of protons. With 88 protons, I know this element is... R-A. Okay. If I knew the name, because I memorized that relationship, I'm going to bet it's not on the list of things to memorize because it's way down at the bottom of the periodic table. Okay. If I knew that name, it's radium. Okay. Where does the 88 information go in this notation? In the bottom. Okay. Why would I put it in the bottom? The atomic number. But the periodic table has it on top. Okay, that's not atomic notation. Remember, what we're talking about here is nuclear notation. I'm concerned about the nucleus. Atomic notation is misleading. It's nuclear notation. Okay, what's in the nucleus? Protons. Well, shouldn't it be up there? What else is in the nucleus? Neutrons. Neutrons. So remember that table where you wanted to go through and memorize? You're like, oh, that's easy. The application of that table tells you where that information or what information needs to be in there. If I did that math right, you should get 226. 
I literally just did it here, so that's why I was checking. Okay, I didn't just know that. Okay, so there we go. We now have the atomic notation. Why might I ask about this element? Probably now five minutes ago. Mary Curie. Mary Curie, isolated radium. That's the one that Rutherford used for his experiments. Okay. Which adds a layer to Curie's aspect or her kind of, in my opinion, aura. If you go through and isolate something that is super cool, like the cure to cancer, what do you think your first step might be? <coughs> name it after Tell yourself. Everyone. Tell everyone. Name it after yourself. Both those are okay. Guess what scientists actually do? Test it again. Testing is part of it, yes. They patent it. Why do you patent it? So no one can steal it. And I can make money. So it's interesting. You all passed that test because nobody said patent it. You may have said that in your head. That's OK. okay? And making money isn't necessarily a bad thing. What did Curie do with her knowledge of how to purify radium? She gave it for free to everybody. Okay? She didn't actually patent it. That allowed for a larger expansion of knowledge, much quicker potentially than if she'd gone through and patented it and controlled how people got access to that information. Did she do that because she was a lady? Uh, why is always going to be an interesting question because that's probably all up in her head and the people around her. I would like to say that she was cool <laughs> and just thought it was neat to share information. Okay. Um, and this is a massive ethical debate within science as a whole. When you come up with a discovery, what should, you, what should the person with that discovery do? Should they patent it and now make up for all that time they spent studying it and not getting any money? Or should they make it publicly accessible so everybody has access to it? It is a pretty huge debate. Right? And we can talk about that outside of class if you would like. Yes? I'm just thinking, um, is there any The mass number and the atomic mass are related. Yes, they're, we will talk about that. They're not the same, but they're really close. They seem to be darn close. Wouldn't they be pretty much the same thing? And in fact, interestingly enough, if we look at radium, radiums is exact. exact. It's also in parentheses. That's kind of weird. Okay. We'll evaluate that Okay, because that is an important thing. They are related, but they're not the same thing. Where I thought you were actually going with that is radium is radioactive. Okay? So if we had a source of radium just sitting on the table here, you probably should not be sitting near it. Okay? But if I put down a sample of carbon, how many of you are going to run from that? <coughs> no one. Why? Carbon is typically not radioactive. Why is radium always radioactive? What's unstable about it? Okay, what is nuclear radiation? It has to do with the nucleus. So what's happening with radiation is that our nucleus is falling apart. Why would our nucleus fall apart? Something is unstable about it. How do you make a nucleus? You take protons and you jam all the protons into the same space. What's the problem with jamming protons near each other? They naturally repel. So what do we do? We add some neutrons. So we add a little bit of glue. Okay, the little bit of glue holds those together pretty well. What happens when we get up to, say, something like radium? How many protons are we trying to put in there? A lot. Which means how much glue do I have to use? A lot. Eventually what happens... I can't add enough glue to keep those particles together, and it starts to fall apart. So when we look at radioactive elements, you'll notice they're almost always with these parentheses. Okay. 
because those elements are radioactive, the nuclei are unstable. As soon as we start jamming things in there, they've gotten so large, I can't add enough glue to keep them together, and they fall apart. Okay? If we compare this out in the real world, it's like two marbles being our protons, and we add some glue to them. Okay? Third marble, we add some more glue. Okay? If we add 88 marbles together, there's now so much glue that the inside glue doesn't have quite enough time to hold or form a tight bond, and it starts to come apart. Okay? The interesting thing about nuclear radiation is that it comes apart in very predictable fashions. Whereas if we just jammed a bunch of glue together, probably what's going to happen to our nice nucleus? It just randomly falls apart. Okay? It's not random when we look at nuclear radiation. It has very particular patterns. Okay? It's one of the reasons why uh, Curie gets famous, too, is because she was able to predict how these things fall apart. Not this class, though. So, Isotopes. Our protons define the element. The neutrons define the isotope. Okay? We could look at it as, as a type of the element because it's still the same element. Okay? We could also phrase that not as type but as mass of the element. Okay? So let's take a look at a simple example. We'll go as simple as we can. We'll look at hydrogen. <coughs> hydrogen actually has two common isotopes. There's actually a third. Right, but there's two common isotopes. We have protium. Right? What is the mass for protium? The mass number for protium? One. Which means how many neutrons does it have? Okay, a couple people are starting to go zero. It's not one because... We have to realize the mass number is protons and neutrons. It already had a proton, so its mass minimally has to be one. How many neutrons do I have to add to get to one? Zero. So there are zero no neutrons for protium. Okay? And we can look at that single aspect, which means if I just look at the nucleus, what's in the nucleus? Just a proton. What name do I call it? Protium, because just a proton. Okay? We also have deuterium. Okay? This is still hydrogen because it still only has one proton. But what is special about deuterium? We now have one neutron, which changes the mass number to two. So now what's in the nucleus? A neutron and a proton. So I could call it protonutrobium which is kind of difficult to say. Instead, we call it deuterium. Do we just make up deuterium? Deuces. 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 Deuces for two. two, or dual for two. When we call it deuterium, what are we saying? Two. There are two things in the nucleus. Okay. What if we add another neutron to the nucleus? What would the mass be? Three. What do you think we'll call that one? Tritium or tritium. Tri for three. Okay. So if you hear, have heard reference to tritium, it's hydrogen with two neutrons. Okay. So if I look at hydrogen, a random sample of hydrogen, some of it is protium, some of it is deuterium. I could go through and create a new symbol for each of those. And because these are relatively simple, we do do that. Okay? But you don't, so don't worry about it. Okay? I don't want to create a new symbol because they're still both the same element. And for the most part, their chemical reactivities are identical. Okay? So how do I find information about the existence of this other isotope? Right, well, if there's two isotopes there, what if I want to determine the mass of hydrogen in that sample? Well, hydrogen includes both protium and deuterium. What would the average mass be? How would I calculate that? I want to determine the average mass between, sorry, what's your name? 
Ariana? Ariana and me. What do we got to do? Tell me. I add up the two masses and y by 2. OK. I want the average mass for hydrogen. What do you do? OK. We add up the masses. The mass of protium is 1. The mass of deuterium is 2. And I divide by 2. And I would get. Some of us are really good at that math. That's OK. Some of us aren't. We have calculators. It's OK. You could use them. Everybody laughs like, ha ha, that's not nice. I got to use calculator half the time too. The only reason I don't hear is I've done this one too many times. Okay? And I get 1.5. Okay? So the average mass for hydrogen is 1.5. Okay? That would be the atomic mass now for hydrogen because it took into account both of my isotopes. So it's 1.5. What is the atomic mass for hydrogen on the periodic table? 1.01. I just calculated it to be 1.5. We made a really, really big assumption in this calculation. Is that protium and deuterium are equal? We made the assumption that they are equal in the sample. Deuterium is Is that necessarily true? No. no. So where is that assumption in this? Because believe it or not, it's already embedded in this calculation. Okay, so we're making the assumption they're equal, which means how much of the sample would be protein? Give me a percentage. 50%. And I heard someone say 0.5. I'll accept both of those. How would I get 0.5? What would I mathematically have to do to get 0.5? 1 divided by 2, or half of 1. There we go. Okay. That's all going to become important here in a second. So I'm going to clean this up because we're going to break some stuff down here. We had 1 plus 2 divided by 2, right? Okay. That is also the same as saying 1 over 2 plus 2 over 2. Yeah? Okay. Ooh, 1 over 2. That's interesting. Okay. That is also the same as saying 1 over 2 times 1. Yeah? Like, that's kind of silly. Why would you do that? I'm thinking ahead. Plus 1 over 2, kind of weird, times 2. This 1 over 2 and this 1 over 2 have the same meaning. What are those 1 over 2s? Like they're 50%. There's our assumption. When we went through to calculate this average, that 1 over 2 is actually our internal assumption, that we have an equal percentage of both of those pieces. What is in parentheses? the mass for each of those species. So when I run the calculation, I'm actually taking the percent of one isotope times the mass of that isotope plus the percent of the second isotope times the mass of the second isotope. That's actually what I'm doing when I calculate an average. For a simple average, we just do add the parts divided by the total number. Okay? That embeds in it the assumption that they're all equally weighted. Kind of makes sense? Okay. What if they aren't equally weighted? We would need to know the percent of each of those isotopes. So I'm going to leave that formula up there. This is one you will probably have to use a calculator for, unless you want to kind of just use some pretty awesome predictive skills. Protium, it turns out, makes up 99% of our hydrogen. Deuterium makes up the remaining 1%. For those of you saying, didn't you say tritium exists? Ignore what I said. 
It is true, but it isn't necessary for our calculations. With that information, tell me what the atomic mass is for a hydrogen sample. So what would you do? So I heard a 99 times 1. We have to be a little bit careful on that, because I really shouldn't be writing percent. 0 0.99. I have to be looking at the fractional value. Okay, So it's 0 0.99 times 1, why would you multiply by 1? That's the mass of the first species, which we're calling A in this case. Plus 0 0.01, which is our percentage, times 2. Those of you with calculators get 1 point what? 1.01. 1 .01. Take a look at our periodic table. 1.01, .01. those random numbers that Mike just pulled out of thin air for 99% and 1%. Yes. <laughs> they aren't 100% random. I did kind of know them. Okay. Or at least close enough to get the answer. Okay. I do not expect you to know those percentages. I do expect you to be able to run through those calculations. I do expect you to recognize that when we do this calculation, that that number is our atomic mass. So let's actually go down to the formula. That when we take that calculation, we now have the atomic mass. And that atomic mass is found where? On the periodic table. And as was importantly added to that, that's a U underneath the symbol on the periodic table. So Say that again? It's the average of all the isotopes. It is the average of all of the isotopes. Sort of. It's not a perfect average. Because if it was a simple average, we said the mass was 1.5. So it's not a simple average. What kind of average is it? It's a weighted average. I'm taking into consideration that the percents of each of those are different. So what we're looking at with this calculation at the bottom is a weighted average. Okay. The weighted average is what gets you your atomic mass. How do you know what isotopes to include or which ones to discard? How would you know which isotopes, isotopes to include or not? Did someone just make fun of me saying isotopes? <laughs> Night. I heard someone mumble it over here. Okay, so we could go through and look at it in a book. Okay, on an exam, how many of you have your textbook? You all should be keeping your hands down. You don't have your textbook on the exam. You don't have the internet on the exam. How do you get this information? It has to be given to you. Okay. I do not expect you to memorize it. Okay. We could go through and look at it for lead, just how many neutrons. We've already done that calculation. That's not this one. So what we're talking about here is really a percent, okay? unitless information. Okay. It's how much of one quantity in comparison to the total <laughs> sample. Okay. Uh, sorry, so this is straightforward there. So what we just talked about is our simple versus weighted average. Okay. That previous slide is a simple average. Okay. And we'll come back to that calculation in just a second. Okay. For isotope mass, that's now a weighted average. How would I go through and do this? Okay. A weighted average takes into consideration those percentages. So how could you see this as a test question? Gallium has two isotopes. 69 gallium with a mass of 68.926 AMUs. What is an AMU? Atomic mass unit. How many of you didn't know that? Really? Only like six of you didn't know that? Okay. Doesn't matter. I don't care. Okay. We haven't talked about making any measurements yet. We just know that it's, it's some value associated with that. 
the m if we know mass. Cool. There we go. That is now the mass for it. It has a 60.11% abundance and gallium-71. What is the mass of gallium-71 in AMUs to four significant digits? Don't stress necessarily about the significant digits either in this calculation. So how would I go through and solve this? What information do I know? So going to the numbers right away isn't necessarily a bad thing, and you're typically trained to do that. Just start pulling out numbers. The numbers aren't useful if you don't have a meaning associated with them. What is the meaning of that 60.11% tied to? Gives you the percentage for what? <coughs> gallium 69. So for gallium 69, I know that I have a 60.11% because I'm kind of suspicious I'm going to have to do a calculation, I might immediately convert that out of a percent. Please reconnect. Please reconnect. Thank you. Percent means per cent. What is a cent? 100. 100. So this is really 60.11 divided by 100, which is really 0. 0.6011. So those of you who are like, well, how did he go from 99% to 0.99? That's how he did it. Percent means per 100. When we go through to do a calculation, that's what's happening. Okay, what else do we know about gallium 69? We know the mass is 68.926 AMUs. Do we have any more information? Again, with the calculation, hold back, hold back. Atomic number for what? I already wrote down the atomic number. Uh, no, sorry. We have we'll deal with the, the atomic number percentage of the gallium-71 by just No, we don't have the percentage of gallium-71 explicitly stated. It says it only okay. has two isotopes. And again, gallium-71 is the important first thing to identify. Writing down random numbers doesn't help you if you don't remember what they're tied to. And for those of you saying, but I know what it's tied to, right. do it on an exam where you're stressed out of your mind that you're going to fail the class, and you don't know what it's tied to. Write that information down. We're now writing down that we know information about gallium-71. What do I know about the gallium-71? Well, I'm going to need to know its mass and the percentage. Okay. Does anybody see the percentage, and we'll get to, I know where you guys are going, is the percentage explicitly stated? No. 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 Is the mass explicitly stated? No. Only for one. The mass is explicitly stated for gallium-71 in what? And that I need to solve for it. Yeah. Okay, so that is now absolutely an un unknown value. I actually don't know what that is. I have to solve for that. That, to me, would be underlining the question mark. That's my solve. Okay? To solve for it, I need to know the percentage, right? And I'm only given the percentage of gallium-69. Okay? There's another piece of information embedded in the question. What is that piece of information, guys? Gallium has two isotopes. There are only two isotopes for gallium, which means if I add up the percentage of one isotope to the percentage of the other one, what it had better equal? A hundred percent. So that means 60.11 plus some unknown percentage for our gallium 61 must equal a hundred percent. I can now solve for that percentage being 39.89. I'm just trusting you guys. I can't do that math that fast. Okay, percent, which again, I'm suspicious I'm going to have to run a calculation. That's the same as saying, I already forgot the number, 39.89 over 100. I forgot it, but it was on the board. Which is the same as 0 0.3989. Now what can I do that I have all of this information? I can figure out the mass. Because I know a fancy little equation, right? I know that if I take the percent of isotope A times the mass 
of isotope A plus the percent of isotope B plus the mass of isotope B, I could figure this out. So I'm going to go through the, go away, stupid screen. Percent of A was? Okay. 0 0.6011. Okay. Does that look like 6.691? Yeah. Making a simple slide can mess with your calculations, so be careful when you go through and write things out. The mass of A was? Plus the percent of B? 0 0.3989 times the mass of B. That's my solve. I need to solve for it. What's a good thing to put in for a solve? X. X. Don't want to use X? Doesn't matter. Pick something. God, I keep forgetting I'm right. <coughs> Just pick something. So I'm solving for X. Can I solve that equation? Why can't I solve that equation? I need to know what's on the other side of the equation. The atomic mass. That equation equals the atomic mass. So it's not zero, because a lot of people will drop zero into that and now solve for x. You have to remember it's the atomic mass. Okay, where in the question did it specify the atomic mass for gallium? So for those of you at home potentially rewatching the video, the answer from the class was it doesn't. So how can I solve for the mass? The periodic table tells you the atomic mass. So now I can go to the periodic table and find for gallium the atomic mass is 69.72. Now I can solve for x. Make sense? Okay. While you guys are frantically trying to solve that, because I do not have that solved, I'm going to write down some multiple choice answers, and we'll work from there. And I didn't record it. I thought it was a good explanation. Sorry. So here's our new question. And I apologize for those watching at home. You can get angry at me later. Okay. I want to know the percent copper in my bronze. Why did I write BRZ? Lazy. I don't want to write out bronze. Okay. Why did I write Cu instead of copper? Because that's the element symbol. Again, I'm lazy. I can take advantage of that. Okay. Percent copper. Okay. It's the one quantity over the total sample. So what am I looking for? I want the mass of copper over the, mass of both. the total mass the mass of both is a better way of phrasing that. What is your both? The mass of copper plus the mass of tin. That number is not 100 because that is a secondary question. So you can't add that information in. 
All right, so what was the mass of copper? Seventy-nine point two grams. Okay. What was our total mass? Seventy-nine point two plus ten point eight. For those of you who are good at math, you're a horrible person. Ninety point zero grams. Okay, now you're not a horrible person. Uh, just for the record, multiply by a hundred percent, and I would get my answer. Okay, which comes out to be 88%. Good job. Everybody make sense of that? What does that say, mass point? Uh, ooh, Plus good point. Mass. What did I use for writing mass of copper? Did I write out copper? No, you wrote CU. I wrote CU. Why CU? Because that's the elemental symbol. That's the elemental symbol for copper. Plus the mass of, of, of tin. I didn't write tin. What did I write? SN. What is SN? Tin. The symbol for tin. Okay. That tends to be a common one to get tested on. Why? Because it makes no logical sense between the symbol and the name, just as a reference. Okay. So you could typically see questions with SN in reference to tin, silver, silicon, scandium. Okay. They're all S symbols or S words that don't necessarily match up with their respective symbols. Does that make sense? What if I switched it to how much tin is in 100 grams of bronze? All right, well, how could I do that? Now I know my total sample is 100 grams, and I'm trying to solve for the mass of tin. Do I know the percent of tin? Careful. Does it explicitly <laughs> state the mass of tin? No. no. Okay. So I would need to know the mass of tin. What did we just solve for in the previous question? Okay. Careful. The percent mass of copper plus the percent mass of tin should be what? Because there's only two things. Bronze is an alloy of copper and tin, 100%, which means the mass of tin is, or percent mass of tin is 12%. I can do my substitution in 12%, and I always forget that stupid mother effing times 100. And I could now go through and solve, and I would get whatever the mass of tin is out of that which, as silly as that sounds, we should be able to do that pretty straightforward. The mass of tin is 12 grams. Okay? Kind of makes sense? Okay. I do have a couple minutes here. We'll see how excited I want to get. Yeah, we'll kind of set it up. What we've covered so far is now the first half of Chapter 4. The second half of chapter four is all about atomic orbitals. Right? So what we talked about was atomic structure, protons, electrons, and neutrons. What we just addressed with isotopes and percents and all that was protons and neutrons. We didn't talk about the electrons. Okay? The reason we didn't want to talk about electrons yet is most people don't like talking about electrons as far as orbitals go. Okay? And two, chapter five now starts to address where that information, protons and neutrons, are embedded in the periodic table. Okay? So we can jump to the first half of chapter 5 and start to look at the periodic table. Is the periodic table on the wall the only periodic table? No. no. Depending on how we want to organize our information, we could end up with different periodic tables. All three of these are periodic tables. Okay? It would kind of suck to look at the one in the upper left because it's all wobbly. And in fact, I can't even, I don't even think they put letters in some, inside some of those. Why would I want to use that periodic table over the one on the wall? It's an abundance. So maybe what I'm concerned about is how much of each of those elements do I have access to? That periodic table becomes more important than the one on the wall because I've got different information encoded in it. Okay? 
the other ones have a different representation for how that information is encoded. Okay? Remember, our periodic table is a really fancy decoder ring that you know you found in your cereal box. Okay? That's what a periodic table is. Okay? There's information there. We have to decode it. That information is organized according to how people thought about it. And that's how we'll pick up the next one, Tuesday.